Okay. Let me know if you can see it in the screen. Can you see my my slides? Yes, yes, we can. Yeah. Okay, so just a brief overview of what we're going to cover today. Uh, just start with the basics. What is interface design and uh, why do we do it? Uh, give a few examples of uh, elements of interface design and principles that you can use to help you decide uh, how, what to use, which elements to use and when to use them. And then we can have uh, questions at the end. If you have any questions, you can raise them. So, so yeah, first, what and why uh, interface design? So a brief definition, um, user interface design basically just focuses on what you actually see in software applications on the web, like the apps that you use on a daily basis. I'll give an example, maybe Instagram, Google, when you're searching for something, what you see on the screen is interface design. It was designed by someone and a lot of thought went into it. The icons, the text that you see, um, the images that you see, the illustrations and the animations that you see, a lot of thought went into that. And uh, we'll talk about that uh, today. So why uh, do we do interface design? In order to create interfaces or yeah, experiences that are easy to use, and pleasurable. It doesn't have like it can be easy, but it also has to be fun. It also has to be enjoyable. It also has to be attractive as well to look at. So next, I'll give a few examples. Uh, I'll try to cover as many as I can, but there's a lot more. Uh, so I'll give it a few examples of the different elements that make up user interface, user, yeah, user interfaces, and give you some guidelines on how to use them. So when, for one thing that I need to mention before going on is that when designing your interface, you need to be consistent and predictable with the choice of elements that you use because uh, people are, they, they are accustomed to a certain way, accustomed to a for things to work a certain way, right? Like if I see a specific icon or like a search, I'll give an example of Google. If I see the search box, which is just like, like an input box, which is long and with the rounded corners, I automatically know that that's a search box. So if I go to your site and I find that the search box is now a triangle or a circle, I may not know that this is actually a search box. So it's important that um, you use elements that are familiar to users so that it helps with task completion and efficiency and satisfaction. So I've grouped them in a couple of categories. So we'll start with uh, input controls. And I've highlighted uh, these ones up here, the most common ones. So, for example, we have checkboxes. Uh, these are, are they allow users to select one or more options from a set. Let me just switch really quick and then show you what that looks like. I have some examples here. So we can actually see how it works. Yeah, so you can 
This is what I mean by a checkbox. This is probably already familiar to you. So you can select, then unselect. And this allows you to select more than one option in a list. So it's uh, mostly used for that purpose. If you want users to select more than one option, then you use checkboxes. And then look for another one. have buttons as well. That is if you want users to perform a certain action, like to submit uh, text, or if they've entered information into a form, they can click on a button and then submit. Um, to show you what some others. And then we also have radio buttons. Now these are most are used to if you want users to select only one option. So they easily confused with the checkboxes, but the difference is that with the checkboxes you can select more than one, and then with the uh, a radio the radio buttons you only select one option. Those are just a few examples when you go back to Yeah, so yeah, I've shown you checkboxes, I've shown you buttons and radio buttons. And then there's drop downs. That one is uh, you select and then it, drop, it shows a list of options for you to choose. That is pretty similar to the radio buttons as well. It's just that you, uh, it's, it's more compact. It's not, the options do not appear in a the list, they're hidden within the drop down button. So it allows you to save space. So if you if you want the same functionality as radio buttons, but you want to save space, you can use drop downs. And then toggles, these are commonly used to switch between states, like to turn something on or off. Or yeah, to turn mostly to turn something on or off, just to change the state of uh, uh, an option. And then text fields, those are the ones that uh, are very you must be very familiar with where you just enter text. I'll give an example, like a search box is a is a text field um, where you can enter text and it can have either a single line or multiple lines. Um, other examples that you can also explore on your own as well, uh, I listed them up here. Input steppers, those are like uh, I'll give an example. Let's quickly share my screen. See if I can show you an example. Okay, I don't have an example of that one, but I what I can I can describe it. Uh, when you input text and then it's like a sort of like a wizard where you have um, a form shows up with different text fields inside, and then you en enter your text, and then you have a button at the bottom in the corner saying next, and you click keep clicking next, next, next to continue entering uh, more information as you go within the process. An example that I can give is like when you install new software 
for you install um, a new application and you have to do some setup before and then it takes you to do some uh, wizard where you have to keep keep clicking next to uh, input information and maybe it's asking you for some details, profile details or banking details that you have to add and you keep clicking next. That's also an example. Um, I also mentioned a uh, date picker. I don't have examples for all of those right now, but a, a date picker, that one allows you to choose the date. It just shows you the calendar uh, with the dates and the months and you can uh, pick the dates. Yeah, and split buttons, those just have two functionalities with a, a line in the middle, just splitting the words between uh, with a divider, sort of like a divider in between the two texts. Like it's one button with two options side by side and then a divider in the middle. Um, I'll encourage you to Google all these all this information is available online. You can just Google and then you show images of input steppers, bit buttons, step pickers. And you can see those, what they look like. Uh, for navigation, the examples that I have are a search box. Um, I know the most familiar function is that you uh, you know, or you might be aware of for a search box is to just find things uh, or find sites or find files or documents. But you can also use a search box to navigate within a to, nav to navigate within a site. Uh, and it helps you if you don't know exactly how the site works. So if you don't know where things are within a site, you can use a search box to navigate. And then breadcrumbs. Let me show the screen to show what these look like. This is an example of breadcrumbs. This just helps you helps users find out or know where they are within a site, like if they're different levels. So we have the, the parent level being home here in this example, and then it has a child level, which is the next level down, and then that has also a child level, which is the current location. So it helps users to know where they are within a site, and they can easily go back and forth. And then pagination. Let me show you an example of pagination. This is an example of pagination where you can just keep moving within different pages. So you have so much content, like a, it's mostly useful for moving through a very long list of content. So you can keep going from page to page. It's very similar to the breadcrumbs, but uh, this is grouped in terms of pages. And you can keep going back and forth, back and forth. And then tags. Let's see. 
And this is a good example of tags. We can add tags to information. It helps to group categories of information. Like if you have, you've grouped your maybe like content within categories and you can uh, use tags to represent the categories and people can uh, click on those tags, they're clickable, and then they can see all the information within that category. And then sliders. Sliders is like an image uh, when you have like a carousel. Let me switch. Actually, there's one right here. This is an example of a slider. So I can flip through the images within on this page by just clicking on these arrows. This is an example of a slider. It can appear in different ways. So there's the two arrows on the side, or they, you can have multiple dots at the bottom of um, the images. Something like this. This is also another example of a slider. Yeah, so for icons, uh, those are also pretty self-explanatory. Um, it's a simplified image or illustration or a symbol that uh, you can use to represent something. Um, though it, for icons, it would be best, it's always best to use uh, icons that are familiar to users that you see used in different sites. Uh, like for, I'll give it again another example for a search. If you have, if you want an icon to represent search, you would use a magnifying glass. Um, if you try to use maybe like uh, another shape, uh, users may not understand what that is. Uh, in some cases, when you want to use an icon and it may not be familiar to users, it, it's very helpful to add some text to help describe what the icon means, if it's not a common thing or if it's not familiar. So that's uh, one way of doing it. And then other examples are tabs, back to top buttons. Those are the ones that usually appear like on a very long page at the in the bottom right you notice a button that is pointing upwards with an arrow pointing upwards and it, you can click on it and then it goes all the way back to the top of the page. And then links are the usual links where you find text that is probably highlighted or it's a different color from the rest of the text on the page and you can click on it and then it takes you to another page. And then we have information components. These are mostly like containers that have information. So an example would be the notifications. Those usually have like alerts or um, messages that are important for a user to see. That maybe they are indicating like the system status or what's happening or you've just completed confirmation, like you've just completed uh, a task or you've or your maybe something has changed or like the status of the system has changed. And then progress bars, um, those are like 
when you're opening a page and maybe it takes a bit long to load, um, then you see uh, a bar that shows the, like how much time is left for it to be completed. Another uh, example would be when you're downloading something from the, a website or downloading a document or a video or image and there's a progress bar right underneath the item you're downloading and it's showing you how much time is left to complete the download. It's an example of our progress. Yeah, I've just seen a message about asking for the slides. I will share the slides at the end. So, yeah, progress bars are useful for abstracting complexity. Like when you're downloading something, you don't need to see what is actually happening behind the scenes. So having like that progress bar showing helps to abstract the, uh, or to like, yeah, let the user know what's happening. There's, there's something happening, but they don't need to know exactly what is happening in the background. And then we have tool tips. Those appear when you hover over an item, indicating like maybe the name of an item or the purpose of an item. These are useful when you have like when you when you want to use icons that are probably not so familiar to someone, or if you're using a common icon for a different purpose. You can add, you can have a tooltip. So when someone hovers over an icon or maybe some text and you want to explain more of the purpose of that action or that link or that button or that icon, you can use tooltips. And then we have the modals, which are also like pop-ups or dialog boxes that show up on the top of the screen. Uh, these are commonly used to, in case you want a user to perform a certain action or they need to know or be aware of something before they can move forward within a process. So it interrupts, it is quite intrusive, so it interrupts uh, the user flow or whatever task they may be trying to complete and they have to dismiss it or pay attention to it or like do, performs a certain action before they can move forward on this uh, pop-up. And then cards, those are usually rectangular, square uh, components that you see on the, on the screen. They usually have, like you use them to uh, display information that has like a similar, similar information. If you want to group different kinds of information into different chunks. You can use cards. So they can have text, they can have images, they can have videos and so on. And then forms, these have like a group of things like text fields, it will have buttons, it will have, yeah, all the, all, like the input controls that I showed uh, in the earlier are, these are usually used in forms and they are used to collect information and users can uh, enter the information and submit. And then other components that I can talk about is an accordion. Uh, this is like a drop down. <laughs> yeah, it's like a drop down. You just click on it, a button and that you click on and then it expands to show more information. And then the wizard, I explained it earlier. So I have shared the, I will share these slides at the end of this. And in one of the slides at the end contains all the links to where I got all this information from. And you can see all the images of the different interface elements that I have described in the slides. So now that you have a brief overview of what is out there, what is available to use when you're designing an interface, you need to know when to use these uh, different elements. And it's helpful to use psychology to make these decisions. So I will go, I will share a couple of 
principles. Um, I know he, the word that I've used here is laws. It doesn't mean that you have to uh, abide by these laws. They're just uh, suggestions or like uh, ways of thinking that you could use to help make decisions. Uh, there's no one right answer. Like you don't have to follow a specific set of laws in order to come up with a solution. So these are just like to help you, to guide you, to help you make decisions when deciding what elements to use in your designs. Um, but they're not so strict, like you, you can feel free to mix them up and um, use them depending on your scenario what, and decide what is best for the user. At the end of the day, the user is the most important person in when you're coming up with your design. So it really depends on who your user is. So the first one that I will talk about is, I, I've mentioned this uh, a bit earlier, how users spend most of their time on other sites and they prefer your site to work the same way as all the other sites they already know. So trying to introduce new types of interaction, new ways of uh, displaying content or like the example I gave of when you use an icon that is already known by users to uh, to be meant for a certain thing or a certain action, and then you use it for something else. Like you say, for example, you're using a magnifying glass, which is commonly known to be used for search, to represent search, like I want to search for something. And then you use the magnifying glass uh, to represent help like if you click on this magnifying glass you will be able to receive help or you can submit feedback that would be very confusing to users and it's not helpful so one of the techniques that you could use to uh, apply this law is personas uh, personas help foster empathy with users and you you'll be able to understand the mental model of uh, of your users, their traits, their needs, their motivations, and their behaviors. So, yeah. So, uh, mental model is how we interpret how we interpret the world, like how we understand things. So, if I know that. A mag like the example again that I gave, like if I know that uh, a magnifying glass represents search, then I expect it to work that way. So if you put a magnifying glass next to a text field, I will interpret that as this is a search box. And you don't, you may not necessarily have to even write that this is a search box, explicitly write the word search box. But because the, I can see a text field next to a magnifying glass, uh, my mental model of that is that this is a search box. But if you change that and maybe use a different icon or a different uh, input input control, then that will confuse people. And then. The next one that I will talk about is the time to acquire a target is a function of the distance to and the size of the target. So this is mostly about touch targets. And I feel like this law, this principle mostly applies to mobile devices. Uh, you need to have your controls or actions like buttons, radio buttons, links. They need to be large enough for users to select and have enough spacing between them. And easily accessible on the device that they're being used, they're using. So, for example, with mobile devices, they're smaller screens, so buttons need to be a bit bigger, right? Because they're using. Oh, can you see? You can see my screen. I saw someone post a message that they I should share my screen. You can see my slides. 
Yeah, okay. yeah, we can see us. Okay, what you were saying that you share the stance of the after the session? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, on mobile devices, there's limited space. So you need to, uh, and also the fact that users are not using, you don't have like, they're not using like a mouse or anything. So you can't, Oh, someone says that they're on slide seven. Wow. Are you all on slide seven? You're not seeing uh, sit slow or something? Okay, I guess those, those that are having the issues, they can re try and refresh and see if it's Okay. okay. Oh, I'm seeing someone who's on slide. Okay. Let me just refresh because there's some people who are in the same slide as I am, and then there's someone still behind. No, them. They should refresh, not you. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You're slide eleven. Yeah. So it should try and refresh. Maybe they have their network as an issue or some. Okay. Okay, so yeah. Um, yeah, mobile devices have a uh, smaller space and you, users are, they, when you're holding your mobile device, you use your thumbs to interact with the screen. Uh, whereas on a computer or a laptop, you have a cursor or like a, a mouse to control the cursor so that you're able to be more like specific with what you click on. So on mobile devices, it's better to have touch targets or click targets. Yeah, touch targets that are big enough. Like the buttons need to be big enough. They need to be accessible. Um, and if you're if you have like links on the website, um, they needs to be enough space between them so that if I'm clicking with my or if I'm yeah if I'm clicking with my thumb I you need to there needs to be enough space so that I don't end up touching another link that I did not intend to click on. Right. So the next one that I will talk about is Hicks law, where the time it takes to make a decision increases with the number of complexity of choices available. So for this, uh, how we can, an example I can give is like, when you have options in like a list or you have a bunch of radio buttons or you have a drop down, and you want users to select, uh, it, it's best to limit the number of options that they have to uh, pick from because they'll take so much time. If you give them so many options, it'll take so much time to make a decision. So it would be best to limit the number of options. Maybe you can give them the option to expand more, to see more. A good example is like an accordion, the uh, example, the element that I talked about, an accordion where you can expand to view more content. Uh, it will show you a summary and then you expand to see more content. So that's a good uh, example of how to apply this law. I'll show you what that looks like. Then I've been talking a lot. Um, an example is this site now here. Um, they have this card on the site here, and it's giving you a couple of options to help you prepare for your day. But they've only limited them to only four, and they've added an additional button for you to see more if you would like. So this is this will help me decide really quick because I only have four options to pick from. 
another example. Show you how the accordion works. Yeah, so you see with the accordion, this is an, an accordion. And then you can put like a title of the content. You Now here you're just revealing only the title. And then they can expand to see more content, right? So you're limiting the amount of information that you're showing so that uh, people or that users are not overwhelmed with information. So they can easily, just by looking at just this one line of text, they can easily decide what do I want to look at instead of having to go through all of them and read everything. Sorry, my Wi-Fi went off for a bit. Can you see my screen again? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so when it hits low now, uh, I was talking about how the time it takes to make a decision increases with the number and complexity of choices available. So a technique that you can use to apply this is uh, card sorting. Uh, this is uh, a research, actually, a research technique that you can use where you ask users to sort information. You group, you identify categories uh, that groups the different kinds of information that you have, and then you ask them to sort it in, in terms of priority and, and where where they think, where they think that certain type of information would fall. Like you can have multiple categories and then you have different items within those categories. So you ask them to sort those items according to priority. And also if they feel like these items actually fit within this category or they should be moved across the categories. So this just helps you identify what is the priority for users, what are they most interested in? What do they want to see first? And then uh, we have Bella's law, where the average person can only keep seven items in their working memory. So the advice that I would give here is that organize content, organize, always organize your content into smaller chunks. So this will help users process and understand and memorize easily. And remember that short term memory varies per individual. Some people may be more experienced and they may have more knowledge or maybe they have more. I'll give an example like they will be more familiar with using computers and technology and websites and the internet. And then there are some who don't have that same level of knowledge. So it's, it's good to always keep that in mind. Uh, a good, an element that can help, that helps with this is cards. Like the example that I gave before with cards, where you can, you can group information, similar information within cards so that people can easily scan the content and uh, memorize it easily.
and postels law. Be conservative in what you do. Be liberal in what you accept from others. So what? how I can explain this is, for example, when you have forms um, and you are accepting, like uh, you want users to fill out a form, enter information. For example, you want them to enter their name and someone can enter a name that has symbols or numbers. So you need to be accommodating with this. Don't restrict the input fields to only accept text. Another example that I can give is when I'm searching for something and uh, maybe I type in, you're expecting text, right? And I enter a symbol or I enter numbers and then I want, I expect you to return some results after I've clicked the search button. Um, a good way to support this is to have a no results page showing the user that the uh, input that you have put in or the query that you have put in, we don't have results to match this query. Try re rewriting the query or try, or you can even give them suggestions on what they can search for if what they're looking for doesn't happen to exist on your platform or system. So it's always uh, helpful to be empathetic and flexible and tolerant of the different actions that a user could take or any input that they might provide. So the more we anticipate and plan for in our designs, uh, the, more the more resilient our designs can be. And then we have the peak end rule. So people usually judge an experience largely based on how they feel at its peak and at its end. So there are peak moments like when you have failed to complete a task or there's an error that has shown up, you expected results to show or information to show and an error showed up and you're frustrated, like I can't complete this task. It's, 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 it's helpful to identify these emotional peaks within your user journey and use them as opportunities. Like for example, if I fail to complete a task, uh, this is when you can put like a, an illustration, uh, an illustration that can help them calm them down and reduce their fr frustration. Maybe it can be a funny illustration and then you can add a feedback link or if they've completed a task successfully, you can show like confetti to congratulate them and oh, congratulations, you've completed the task successfully. Yeah, and then it's important to have an aesthetically pleasing uh, interface because users usually think that if I look at something that is designed really nice, then they're, they're more forgiving of the system or the site. So they may not notice uh, any usability issues because they're distracted by how beautiful or pretty a uh, site might be. But you need to be aware of this as well when you're doing usability testing, to make you cover that next week, uh, that aesthetically pleasing sites can also uh, hide some usability issues because users are distracted by how nice it looks. But that is also one thing that you could do, like there may be some small issues here and there in your design, but if it's aesthetically pleasing, then people are more forgiving and they won't complain as much. Yeah, and then if uh, for this one where multiple similar objects are present, the one that differs from the rest is most likely to be remembered. So if you want, there's a specific action that you want users to take, make sure that it stands out. Like if it's a button, make sure that it has a, a color that is very visible and is distinct and different from the rest of the page. But also it's important to be aware of people who may not, who, be, who might be colorblind and who may not uh, be able to see as well. So you need to use other, uh, you also need to uh, use other ways or other means to uh, 
differentiate important actions like maybe text or uh, animations or yeah, some motion design as well. Yeah, and then this one. Yeah. Yeah, there is always a certain amount of complexity uh, behind sites. For example, I gave an example earlier about downloading something, downloading a video, downloading an image. Um, it's not some it's helpful if you relieve users of this burden by hiding, abstracting that complexity. Uh, by using progress bars, or loading screen, or spinner, or um, uh, yeah, like a progress bar as well, and um, some sort of information or some text, letting them know what is happening. But you don't have to explicitly tell them, show them what is happening in the background. But you need to let them know that something is happening. You left this uh, amount of time to complete this task so that they are aware of what's going on. Yeah, and then the last one. Yeah, this is mostly about speed. Uh, when a computer and its users interact at the pace, that ensures that neither has to wait for one another. I know this may seem like it is, it's, up to the developers to fix this. That if something is taking too long to load, it's entirely on, on developers or engineering. But design can also help out in this situation as well. Again, with using progress bars and uh, loading screens as well to show that something is happening. And even when if it loads too quickly, you need to let the user know that something has happened, something has changed. Yeah, I know we're out of time, but um, I don't know if we can still have some questions, if there are any questions, but I will share these slides afterwards. I'm seeing a question that does the color code affect the attention of users? Um, yeah, different colors. Uh, one thing that I could recommend is reading up on the psychology of colors. I did add a link actually on that uh, in the last slide. Um, different colors have different meanings. And different colors can be used uh, depending on the scenario, depending on the area or location that you're in because some colors mean different, have a different meaning in different countries, in different locations, in different cultures. So just because for you, you might understand red as meaning stop or error or something bad, but in another country, the culture may understand red as something good, as something nice, so they may not understand that. So yeah, yeah, colors do mean something to users, they do have an impact, they do have, they do uh, have an influence on users' perception of your interface. So it's important for you to understand that. I've added a link here that talks about the psychology, of, the psychology of colors and their meanings. So you can read up on that. When I share the book. Any other questions? Or comments or... I understand you can't speak in English. So if you want to type something, if you want to ask a question or... You can type it in the chat. No problem. No problem. Thank you all for attending.
uh, I'm just going to drop the presentation in the chat right now that you can get it. Oh, I can't attach things. Oh, wow. <laughs> Um, Humphrey, is it possible for me to share the slide with you and then you can share with the rest? Yeah, you can share them with me and then I'll share with them via emails. Okay. Yeah. Okay, all right. Thank you all for attending. Uh, I hope this was helpful. Uh, if you have, um, I hope, look, all the links that I put here are have all the content that I have shared with you in these slides in much, much detail. And especially with the laws of US, there's so many more. I've just talked about 10 of them in this uh, presentation, but there's a lot more uh, that is available. So you can read up on those and get more information. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much Bella, for such a wonderful presentation. It was so much insightful. Yeah. Hope the attendees will go and apply whatever they have learned on this session in their daily activities, in their daily duties, and maybe in their project as they ideate, design, yeah, and they do the research and present. So thanks so much guys for attending, for keeping with us at UT now. Yeah, so this was the third session for in our in our clinics. So the coming week we'll be having the fourth session again, and I guess which will be our last session. So I guess we'll see you then and uh, I will share the resources with you and the recording to this session as well if you want to follow along. Yeah, and uh, yeah, see you then. And uh, happy learning, happy skilling. Bye.